Hey guys, this is a review of Nikon's first entry-level full-frame mirrorless camera called the Z5. In this video, I'm going to go through the main specs of the Nikon Z5 and put it in a bunch of real-life situations to see how it handles, how the autofocus holds up, how well the image stabilizer works, and so on and so on. And of course, as I'm mostly into night photography, I will show you the high ISO and the dynamic range performance as well. My name is Miklos Mayer and my channel is all about photography. So if you are as passionate about cameras as I am and would like to take better photos, this is the right place for you. And please subscribe to my channel so you will not miss any of my new content. The Z5 is Nikon's first entry level full frame mirrorless camera, but you will see there is nothing entry level about it except for its price. It basically has the same professional and durable body as the Nikon Z6, but the Z5 is more of a steals shooting camera. I don't have it in my hands now because I just had it for a week to test provided by the excellent photography store called 220V in Budapest, Hungary. If you are in Budapest and need any kind of photo equipment, check them out. They have everything related to photography. The Z5 sports a full frame sensor with 24 megapixel resolution. Though the resolution is the same as in the Z6, this is not the exact same sensor, it's using BSI technology, which is not as advanced. But you will see that this hardly has any effect on the picture quality. As other Nikon mirrorless cameras, the Z5 has the Z lens mount, so it can only take Z-type lenses. However, you can buy the FTZ adapter and most of the Nikon F or third-party glasses will work just fine. In this review, I tested the Z5 with its kit lens, the 24 to 50 mm F4 to 6.3 lens, which is sold as a kit lens for this camera. Well, it's cheap and small and it has a contractable design. So you have to turn it one way to collapse it and open it the other way and then you can use it. With this contractable design it gets really really small. Obviously this is not a high-end lens but it's not that bad either. Keep watching for some sample photos where we are going to pixel peep at the sharpness. I am very happy that Nikon did not discard the pro photography features of the Nikon Z6. So you still have the very durable and weather sealed body. You still have the excellent in-body sensor stabilization, more on that later, and you even have one eight thousandths of a second shutter speed, plus the ability to have fully silent shutter release. However, I would not use that fully electronic shutter because you will have bending with artificial lights or rolling shutter effect with fast moving subjects. The shutter is pretty silent anyway and there's the option to use an electronic first curtain and a mechanical second curtain shutter. I usually leave this on auto setting, then the camera selects the ideal solution. Let me not forget a major selling point. It has dual SD card slots. So finally there is a Nikon mirrorless camera with proper dual UHS-2 SD card slots so people can stop whining about that. The Z5 uses the same 3.69 million dot electronic viewfinder as the Z6 and I was very happy with that. It's bright and accurate in terms of exposure and I like to use a dedicated EVF, especially in sunlight. The rear screen has lower resolution than on the Z6 with only 1 million dots, but I didn't really care about that because it's more than enough. Of course, it's still a touch screen and can be tilted up 90 degrees and downward 45 degrees and the mechanism feels really durable. Please note that although it's an entry-level camera, the screen does not rotate all the way up or down, so there is no selfie mode on the Z5. I really like how responsive the screen is, you can swipe through the menu as well and of course you can use the well-known finger movements to play back and zoom into the photos. This is just as good as other pro cameras in the market. The Z5 doesn't have a top status display, but other than that, the button layout on the rear of the camera is exactly like on the Z6. The Z5 has a very solid feel, the grip is fantastic, I really love how it feels in my hand. And it doesn't have a plastic feel either. 
The buttons on the back are well placed and can be easily reached with my thumb. So we have this dedicated joystick with which we can move the AF points around the screen. The Z5 has 273 phase detection AF points which cover almost the entire frame. You can have auto area AF in which you can activate phase and eye detection and you can have wide area, dynamic area or single point autofocus. For most of the time the auto area AF did a good job, especially when there were people on the frame. Look how it always finds the rider. These shots all came out 100% sharp on the riders, even though I used F2. If I didn't like the auto area AF, then I used the dynamic area or the single area AF mode. It's easily usable with the joystick. Let's talk about the eye and face detection because that is always a key selling point for mirrorless cameras over DSLRs. And that's the main reason I always advise people to buy mirrorless cameras instead of buying DSLRs nowadays. I've tested this with the 85mm f1.8 S lens which I absolutely loved using. If you have a face in the frame the Z5 will find it and if the face gets close enough then it will easily find the eyes too. It's following the eye accurately even with a busy background. By default it focuses on the eye closer to you but you can jump between the eyes with the joystick or with the arrows. I really like this shot, look how perfectly the sharpness is on her closer eye. I went under a willow tree and the branches were hanging in front of the model's face and the Z5 followed the eyes pretty well here. The eyes are sharp and not the eyelashes. I was happy with the results and I wholeheartedly recommend the Nikon Z5 to portrait shooters. If there is no face to track, you can use the subject tracking mode and it works like this. You press the OK button and then that white square pops up and you can place that anywhere. Once you place it on the subject, you activate the AF, then the square turns yellow and then the Z5 locks onto that initial subject and tracks it around the frame. I went to a horse racing event and I only used the subject tracking shooting with the 85mm lens and I was quite happy with the results. Most of the time the focus was spot on the riders, however sometimes it lost the subjects. The Z5 can only shoot up to 4.5 frames per second, which is way less than the 12 FPS of the Nikon Z6. But to compensate for that, the buffer can hold up to 100 files even in RAW plus JPEG mode, which is pretty impressive. The Z5 also received animal IAF detection as well. Nikon claims it's working on dogs and cats, so I first tested it on a dog with very bright fur. And just look how easily it found the eyes. Of course, just because the camera finds the eyes, that doesn't necessarily mean that the shots are actually in focus. Here the dog is pretty far away, moving out of the frame, but the AF finds the eyes and the shot is super sharp. Or here again the dog is moving and boom it's again sharp on the eyes. And I was using an 85mm lens at f1.8 so that had a super shallow depth of field. Look how the eye of the dog is at the very edge of the frame yet the AF still holds onto it. The focus is spot on the eye. And a few minutes later, this turned out to be my favorite shot. I also tested the animal IAF on a black dog. With this very same dog, the Nikon Z50, which is a year older and crop sensor buddy, had absolutely no trouble with. I will link the video up here. So I was expecting a very similar performance from the Nikon Z5. To my surprise, the Z5 failed to find the eyes for this black dog. I just couldn't believe it. Another Nikon camera had no problem with that and then what happened here? Why didn't it work? I have no idea. Maybe because I used the 85mm f1.8 lens which has a rather slow AF? What do you think? Let me know in the comments. The Z5 just wouldn't find the eyes of Dexter. So I switched to single point AF and then I just placed the AF point on the dog's eyes and then I could get sharp photos of Dexter, like this. 
Then when the dog lay down, I went back to auto area, auto focus again, and although the IAF was not activated, I could get sharp photos. Mind you, I was using f1.8 and I was very close, so the depth of field was extremely shallow. As with other Nikon cameras, you have the eye menu where you can put the most frequently used settings into. This is highly customizable, just go to the menu, custom settings, controls and eye menu. For example, I don't need the metering mode here, but let's put the silent photography function there. You get the idea, you can virtually put any kind of setting into the eye menu. Talking about customization, you can customize almost every button on the camera. For example, you can even customize the function button or the focus ring on the lens to play a specific role if you have a Nikon Z lens. For example, you can change the aperture or exposure compensation with the focus ring on the lens. Or you can just assign the focusing function to it like you would do normally, but I don't like that because I often touch the focusing ring and the camera goes into manual focus override. The camera goes into manual focus override if I'm half pressing the shutter at the same time, which of course happens a lot if I'm using continuous autofocus. So I like to set this to none so there will be no function of the focus ring on the lens. This means that if I'm in autofocus, the focus ring will do nothing. But if I switch to manual mode, then I can still use the focus ring to focus. By the way, this little box turns green if that area is in focus. I think this is a very practical help. Talking about manual focusing, the Z5 has focus peaking as well. You can change the sensitivity and color of the peaking in the shooting and display settings. On the front of the Z5, next to the lens mount, you have two customizable function buttons. By default, it's wide balance and autofocus, and for me, that was just fine. On the side of the camera, you have an USB-C port through which you can charge the camera as well, and an HDMI and a remote release port. And there's a microphone and headphone jack as well for video. All right, let me give you some high-res images of Budapest, Hungary. By the way, you can download all these RAW files to play with. Just follow the first link under the video. So I went to Budapest to take some photos with the 24 to 50 millimeter kit lens from Buda Castle. This is one of my favorite viewpoints. You have a great view of the chain bridge over the Danube and on the Hungarian parliament. For such a cheap and small lens, you cannot have two big expectations, but the lens wasn't as disappointing as I thought it would be. Before we start pixel peeping, let me show you something. I noticed that the NEF RAW files had to be sharpened much more than I usually sharpen my files in Adobe Lightroom. Normally I go with the medium sharpening preset, but here that didn't seem enough. So with the Z5, I usually pushed up the amount slider to 80 or even to 100, and that gave me the sharpness I liked. I don't think it's because of the lens, I think it's just the way that the raw files are put together. This is at 24 mm at f4, and I think that's okay. It's sharp in the center, but to my surprise, also at the extreme corners. If I stop down the lens, the sharpness improves, and of course there is less light fall off on the corners. So far so good. At 50 mm, the widest aperture is only f6.3, which really sucks, but that's the price to pay for the small size. But to compensate for that, the sharpness is surprisingly good. Judging by my eyes, it may even be better than at 24 mm. Stopping down again improves things a bit, but not much. Okay, let's talk about the image stabilization. So the Z5 have, has the same image stabilization technology as the Z6 and the Z7. And in my experience, it's really, really effective in real life. I loved that I was able to handhold shutter speeds as low as 1 8th of a second with the 85 millimeter lens. That's at least three and a half stops of real advantage with the image stabilization. And even with one fourth of a second, I could get half of my photos sharp. Just look at that. Although half of the shots at one fourth second blurred in, those that I got right are super sharp. So combined with the f1.8 aperture of the 85mm lens, I could easily shoot the night scenes of Budapest handheld. 
Look how sharp this lens is from edge to edge, even at f1.8. And here's a funny thing about the image stabilization. With the 85mm lens I could easily shoot with 1 8 of a second, but with the 24 50mm kit lens at 24mm I just couldn't handhold a proportionally longer shutter speed. These shots I took with 1 3rd second at 24mm and none of them are 100% sharp. Though in theory they should be sharp. I think I know why. It's because the kit lens is so tiny it's hard to properly hold it. Also it's lightweight. And when it comes to steadily holding something, the heavier it is, the more stable you can handhold it. So I think that's why I could get longer handheld shutter speeds with the 85mm lens than with the kit lens. Simply because of the size and weight difference. But there was one thing that really bothered me about the image stabilization. Just listen to this. To save battery power, every time you preview a picture or you go into the menu, the camera automatically shuts down the image stabilization with a noticeable click. If you turn the in-body image stabilization off, then this clicking disappears completely. By the way, for night photography, I love the Nikon's usual self-timer setup and it's the same in the Z5, so I can set how much it should wait and how many frames it should take. That's perfect for stacking the light rails together. For example, here I had the camera take several shots in a row, each 13 seconds long at f16, and in post I could conveniently pick the best one or I can just stack a few photos onto each other to make the light rails even longer. The Z5 also has a focus stacking mode and a dedicated timeless program as well. Alright, let's talk about the high ISO performance. So because this is a newly designed full frame sensor, everybody wants to know how the Z5 performs at higher ISO speeds. I went all the way up to my favorite viewpoint in Budapest, the Citadel. From here there's a fantastic view of the Buddha castle and the chain bridge. To test the high ISO performance, I took photos from ISO 100 to all the way up to 1,024,000 ISO. You can download these photos, just click on the very first link under the video. Of course, at ISO 100 it's clear and virtually noise free. This is the raw file, let's look at the 3200 ISO shot. This is the unedited raw with sharpening but no noise reduction. Moving up to ISO 6400, I think it's still alright. It looks as it's supposed to look. The detail is there, but some fine noise appears. Note that this is without any noise reduction. Now let's have a look at the dynamic range. In this test, I deliberately underexpose the scene and then push it up in post. This is a very good test for those situations where you have to expose for the highlights, simply because there are lots of details in the highlights and you don't want to lose them by overexposing the photo. So this means that you will have to brighten up the shadows. So the question is to how much you can brighten up the shadows without introducing too much noise. I was surprised that at ISO 100 the Z5 could handle plus 4 stops pushing pretty well. At plus 5 stops it's still pretty good. Also I don't see any color noise bending which is also a good sign. Basically the ISO 100 push to 5 stops looks exactly the same as the ISO 3200 shot, so it seems that the Nikon Z5 is roughly ISO equivalent. However, I did not do a super detailed test on that. Here's a scene which has a lot more colors. You can see it's perfectly fine at plus 3 stops, so in real life this means the Z5 handles underexposure pretty well, so it's a very good choice for night photography. Now let's talk about the size of the RAW files a bit. The Z5 offers 12 and 14 bit raw shooting and in each mode you can use lossless compressed or compressed format. But the thing is it hardly makes any difference. 
a 14-bit lossless compressed normal RAW file is 31 megabytes, while the compressed 14-bit file is only 27 megabytes. That is just 13% less. I think Nikon should really develop a compressed RAW format that offers a significant advantage in size, like Canon did with their C-RAW file format, which offers roughly 40% reduction in size. I know that everybody will be asking about the battery time. I have to tell you guys that testing the battery power is really, really difficult. What I can say is that I didn't specifically test it, but after taking 450 photos at that horse race, the battery was still roughly at 40%. But I didn't take any video in it, and it was mostly fast bursts of horse riders. Let's talk about the video mode on the Nikon Z5. You have to physically turn that switch to enter into the video mode, which is a good thing in my opinion. So the settings in photo and video mode are totally independent from each other. In video mode you also have the eye menu, but it's totally independent from the photography mode eye menu, so you can put totally different things here that are more usable for video. The Z5 can only shoot up to 60 frames per second in full HD mode, so there is no fancy slow motion option here. There is no log profile, no 10-bit output, just the bare video basics. It can shoot in 4K, but with a heavy 1.7 crop, so it really cuts into the frame. But it's okay, I just don't think that the people who buy this camera will ever want to record 4K videos. They have their phones for that. The good news is that you still have the face detection autofocus in every video mode, it easily recognizes my face even with such a busy background. Here I was recording with the 85mm S lens at f1.8 and as you can see focus was spot on my face. However, funny thing happened when I moved out of the frame. As you can see the camera focused properly on the background, which is fine. But when I came back into the middle of the frame, the Z5 just wouldn't want to refocus on my face. I had to go way backwards and then it was able to find my face. This happened even though I had previously set the AF speed in video mode to be fast and the AF tracking sensitivity to the highest level. I have to tell you that this only happened with the super shallow depth of field of the 85mm lens at f1.8. I found the AF of the 85mm lens to be fairly slow. So here, as you can see, with the kit lens, which obviously has a lot more depth of field, focusing was always right on my face. The Z5 didn't lose track of my face. Overall, I think the autofocus performance in video mode is all right, but you have to pay attention to when you're using a very, very shallow depth of field. And of course, you get the excellent in-body image stabilization, which of course will work with every lens. This is a handheld video shot at 24mm. By the way, this is the place where I spent most of my university years. This is the chemistry faculty building at the Budapest University of Technology. And here's a handheld footage with the 85mm f1.8 lens. This is the Liberty Bridge over the Danube. Here I used the trick that I was pushing my camera away with my fingers against my neck which acts like a counterweight. I learned this trick from Peter McKinnon. On top of the physical image stabilization, the Z5 also has an electronic image stabilization, which cuts a bit into the frame and stabilizes that even more, but I didn't feel the need for that. I found the flat profile to be best for video recording. This looks best after some color grading. However, there was one bug that I noticed in the Nikon Z5. Or is it a feature? If I changed the picture profile in video mode to flat, then the picture profile in photo mode would also be flat, and vice versa. I think the photo and video mode should be completely separated, so this is definitely a bug. I hope Nikon gives me some kind of reward that I spotted a bug. So let's summarize it up. What did I love in the Nikon Z5? The eye and face detection autofocus both in photo and video mode works really really well. The animal IEF also worked well. The quality and the dynamic range of the RAW files is excellent. Subject tracking autofocus is also pretty good. 
for an entry level price, you get a pro body with a fantastic grip and feel. You get dual SD cards in an entry level pro body camera. That's awesome. The electronic viewfinder is really pleasant to look into and using it in real life is great. The touchscreen display and the menu is excellent. The image stabilization on the sensor is really efficient. It offers about four stops of real life advantage. The buffer can hold up to 100 RAW plus JPEG files in burst shooting mode. What didn't I really like in the Z5? The thing is there is not much to complain here because the camera is priced at a so low price range, but the subject tracking could be a little bit more customizable. There should be a compressed RAW file option that offers at least 40% reduction in size with no noticeable quality loss. The maximum burst speed should be more than four and a half frames per second. 4K video is quite heavily cropped and there's an audible click as the image stabilizer is shut down or powered up. So summarizing it up, I think the Nikon Z5 is an excellent choice for those people who'd like to get into the mirrorless world at a low price point, but not wanting to sacrifice anything in the photography specs. And they would like to have a camera body with a pro feel. The kit lens could have a faster aperture, but other than that, it's not as bad as it looks. If you already have Nikon F lenses, just buy the FTZ adapter and you'll be fine. I like the colors of the RAW files and using the Z5 with the 85mm 1.8 lens was just pure joy. So that was my review of the Nikon Z5, I hope you enjoyed it. It would mean a world to me if you subscribe to my channel and also don't forget to download the RAW files at the link under the video. See you soon and all the best from Hungary!